I said, praise the Lord. Thank the Lord for the Bible study tonight. We're doing this so that on Monday after finishing the retreat tomorrow, we don't have to uh, go for Bible study in the night. So we'll become free Monday night in Jesus' name. We're going to rise up. We're going to pray. You want to commit yourself to the Lord in prayer. That the Bible study will reach to your soul tonight. That God will give you the heart of a real obedient child of God. That your mind, your heart, your willingness, readiness to be focused on the word of God. Open your mouth and pray. And tell the Lord, O oh Lord, we are here to serve you. Here to listen to your word. Here to love you. Love your word. Give you the honor, the glory, adoration, respect that is due to your name and all childishness, frivolity, carelessness, Carefree attitude. Adults behaving like babies. People of God behaving like people of the world. That God will take that away from your heart, your life. That has obedient children will be obedient to the word of God. You have a heart that wants to love the Lord and serve the Lord. That wants to help others to focus, concentrate on the word of God without serving as a stumbling block or distraction. To those who have come to worship the Lord with us. Pray, Father, we bless your name for bringing us together as obedient children, respectful children, faithful children, converted people who are put away worldly, sinful things in our lives. We're praying, Lord, as we come to the Bible study tonight, you reach out to every soul and everyone in Jesus' name. We we'll pray that you give us understanding in your word, that you be like these people that we're reading about. Our lives will bring glory unto you all through the days of our lives. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We've been studying about the church of the Thessalonians. And we remember that these Thessalonian believers became born again, converted as Paul, Silas, and Timothy went to them. We read about that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17, verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. That already tells us the people that were in that congregation, eventually when the gospel came to them and they were converted, we have different classes and diverse classes of people there. And the surprising thing and the exciting thing and the beautiful thing is that they maintained the wonderful Ex excellent unity. There were Jews attending that synagogue. These were people that had the word of God. 
when they had the word of God, all they were committed to before, the circumcision and the tradition of the elders, all that passed away. They were born again. They were converted. They were transformed. Their lives were turned around. A mighty transformation are taking place in that church where people refer to as devout Greeks. Look at verse 2. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, three Sabbath days reasoning with them out of the scriptures, and opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted, they agreed, associated, they got affiliated, they joined with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks, a great multitude. The devout Greeks were there that became converted. Those Greeks, before their conversion, they took pride in knowledge. They took pride in worldly wisdom. But as they became converted, a mighty change came upon them as well. Look at the characteristics of those Greeks in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe for the Jews require a sign for the Greeks seek after wisdom that was their nature that was their concentration that was their peculiarity that was their idol that was their commitment that was what they were addicted to. But now they got converted. And there was a mighty transformation. Come back to Acts chapter 17, verse 4. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas. And of the devout Greeks, a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. There were also some chief women, honorable women that became converted in Thessalonica. These were women, elevated women of high rank and standing in the community. They were women of influence. They also had connection with distinguished people in the land, in society. And we're told, when these honorable women, these chief women, these exalted women, these women of high rank and standing in society, when they became converted, a mighty change also came upon them. Look at verse 12 of that Acts chapter 17. Therefore many of them believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. We see have another class of people that became converted in the Thessalonian church. 
We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter one, verse nine. First Thessalonians chapter one, verse nine. But they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we urge unto you, how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There were idol worshippers there too. And these idol worshippers, they heard the word of God. When they had the word of God, that word of God had a transforming effect, a converting effect in their lives. When anyone actually hears the word of the Lord, and he, has, and he hears it savingly, and he hears it in such an effective, effectual manner, that word of God does what he taught to do in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, I'm reading from verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The law of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, perfect, penetrating, pungent, touching our lives. It says, it is so perfect, it converts the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The kind of conversion that those Thessalonians had was practical, was visible, was noticeable for the people to see. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles again. Acts of the Apostles. We're reading from chapter 15. Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 15, verse 3. And being brought on their way by the church, the pastor Phenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and it caused great joy unto all the brethren, declaring the conversion, the transformation, the turning around, the change in the lives of those people. I said their conversion was visible. I said it was practical. I said it was noticeable. How visible was the conversion? How noticeable was the conversion? And how practical was the conversion? Acts chapter 19, reading from verse 18. The conversion of those Gentiles, the conversion of those devout Greeks, the conversion of those notable, honorable chief women, the conversion of those Jews who had earlier being committed to the tradition of the elders was so visible and practical and noticeable. Acts chapter 19, verse 18. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. They believed and they confessed and they made visible, noticeable their past deeds. Verse 19, many of them also, which used curious arts, brought the books together, and they bunch them before all, before all men. And they counted the price of them, and found each 50 pieces of silver. And it seems today, if anybody gets converted today, anybody gets born again today, the life becomes different. The conduct becomes different. The character becomes different. Noticeable, visible, practical. A real change comes upon such an individual. In fact, we are told about another group of people in a neighboring town that also became born again just after the Thessalonians were born again. And were even told they went beyond the Thessalonian believers. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. 
I'm reading from verse 10. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who come in thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica. I pray our church will be like that. We'll be saying that these Thessalonian believers, they were wonderful, wonderful converts. Saved converts. And the converts that had a kind of shining life, beaming out and shining forth the gospel and the obedience and the faithfulness and the transformation was very clear in their lives. But now we even told about another group of believers, the Bereans. It says they were more noble than those in Tesnaica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. Their mind was on the word. Their heart was on the word. Their attention was on the word. Their concentration was on the word. They received the word with all readiness of mind. And then it says they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. And among these, they are not just ordinary people, but told in verse 12, therefore, many of them believed also of the honorable women, which were Greeks and of men, not a few. I pray that that same grace be noticeable in every life in Jesus' name. That church of the Thessalonians became committed to the gospel going everywhere. We're looking at the witness of transformed believers. The witness of transformed believers. And we're dividing the study to three parts. Number one, the exceptional soul winning by saved Christians. Christians who are born again. Christians have definite experience of knowing the Lord. Christians that have the experience that something has taken place affecting their soul, their spirit, their mind, their lifestyle, their character, their conduct, their day-to-day -day lifestyle living. Exceptional soul winning by those saved Christians. Number two, exemplary separation. From a sinful community. Their community was sinful. And yet there was an exemplary separation. They separated themselves from the idolatry of the land. From the evil of the land. From the pollution of the land. From the careless life, defiling life of the land. Exemplary separation from a sinful community. Number three. Expectant saints. Waiting for Christ's second coming. Expectant saints waiting for Christ's second coming. Number one, exceptional soul winning by saved Christians. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 8. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Verse 8, for from you Thessalonians sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. These Thessalonian believers, what a wonderful assembly. What a wonderful congregation. The young and the old. The men and the women. The high and the lowly. The honorable and the humble. How they gave themselves to the Lord. And it says all of them without exception. 
They had such a touch of the Lord in their lives and such transformation in their lives that the word of God sounded out from them. One in Macedonia, not only that. Two, in Achaia, not only that. Three, in every place their faith to God watch was spread abroad so that when the apostles got to those other places, they didn't have to say anything. The gospel was being preached already by life and by their mouth, by those Thessalonian believers. Look at the way the world worked in them. This is the way it will work in us. I said it will work in us. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But this cause also, thank we God, without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men. That's the secret of having the word work in their hearts. They came with the gospel, the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, the gospel of peace, the gospel of your salvation, the gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel that is everlasting, the everlasting gospel. And the people realized this is not the word of man. And they acted as if God came down in human flesh to talk to them. And because of that attitude of mind and disposition, it says, ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us. Ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. They believed that word. Then they became proclaimers of that gospel. And with enthusiasm, with passion, with fire, with fervency, with desire, with purpose of mind, they declared it in Macedonia, in Achaia, as well as in every place. The city of, Thessal of Thessalonica was strategically located in the province of Macedonia. It was a hub of travel and trade. And people were coming through Macedonia, from Macedonia, from the east and the west. And they will go along the Ignatian Highway. They always pass through Thessalonica. And when those travelers and traders were passing through, the Thessalonians will engage them in the communication of the gospel, in the preaching of the gospel. And then you give them the gospel. Their conversation was of the gospel. Their communication was of the gospel. Their sharing was of the gospel. Their interaction was of the gospel. That is the way it ought to be today. That in the market, on the bus, in the taxi, at school, anywhere you go, in your free time, in your busy time, you are sharing the gospel. You are speaking the gospel. You are spreading the gospel. Not only that, there were multitudes of people who also visited the city by sea because it was a city that had ports. And there were people that wanted to use the port facilities in Thessalonica. And the people of God in Thessalonica, the servants of God, and the Christians, the believers, they went to the port. And what were they sharing? They were sharing the gospel. We will share the gospel. Everywhere we go, we look at all the places and all the strategic locations in the city, in every city. And then we take the gospel to them. Tracts are there to be distributed. Messages are there to be distributed. And then your mouth is there to declare the word of the Lord and tell the people how you have been born again, how the change and the transformation has taken place in your life, and how the change and the transformation can take place in their life as well. 
Not only that, there were people from Thessalonica who were traveling out themselves. Some of them businessmen, some of them traders, some of them going to visit their relatives outside in Achaia, in Macedonia, and everywhere. And they carried the gospel with them. That's why it says in that verse 8, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, that your faith is spread Godward. And in every place, your faith is now being proclaimed. Their proclamation of the gospel was like a long, sustained, constant sound of a trumpet echoing into a wider and wider territory and communities of people. Their impact was clear. Our impact in this nation, in this continent, will be clear. Their impact was sustained. Our impact in this nation, our impact in this continent, our impact in the world, everywhere you find deep alive Bible church members, our impact will be sustained in Jesus' name. People will know us for the gospel. They will know us for the glory of the gospel, the grace of the gospel. They will know us for the godliness the righteousness, the holiness of the gospel everywhere in this nation, everywhere in this continent, everywhere beyond this continent, our impact will be extensive in Jesus' name. Now, not only the Tesla believers that their faith was spread everywhere. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ. For you all, for you all, I pray there will be no exception. I said there will be no exception. That those who are sinful before today, they'll become saintly. Those who are childish before today, they'll become totally changed. And those who are just looking down at the non-essentials of life, and their lives have been kind of occupied, taken up. By non-essentials, I pray today, every one of us will look up in Jesus' name. Essential things, important things, eternal things, and things that will be rewarded in heaven will take our attention from today in Jesus' name. These believers and in Rome, it says that Paul the Apostle was thanking, thanking God for all of them. That your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Obviously, they became different. Obviously, they became totally distinguished. Obviously, their lives declared the gospel. And everywhere throughout the world, they said they're different. They're not like other churches. They're not like other religious people. They're not like other religious communities. These ones have the transforming power of the gospel in their lives. That's what will be said of you. I said that's what will be said of you. That you're not just a church goer. You're not just a part of a nominal church, a dead church, a defiled church, a sinful church. You're part of a transformed church. A part of a transparent church and part of a triumphant church. And the grace of God will be revealed in your life in Jesus' name. In chapter 10 of Romans, chapter 10 of Romans, verse 14. Chapter 10 of Romans, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be saved? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But have they not all? They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed that report, so then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. But I say, have they not heard? Have they not heard? Have they not heard? Yes, verily, certainly, 
their sound went into all the earth and their words unto all the ends of the world. Yes, verily. Yes, verily. I just want to remind you that did it have the city-wide, great, massive crusades everywhere, but the people were sharing the gospel everywhere. Individuals in the church were taking the gospel everywhere they went. And that by, by that personal contact, personal communication of the gospel, personal sharing of the gospel, that's how everybody heard. And now the sound of the gospel and the sound of the transforming power of that word went everywhere. And their words unto the ends of the world. Chapter 16. Chapter 16 of Romans. We're looking at it in verse 19. 16, 19. For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. Your obedience is come abroad unto all men. The Thessalonian believers had that same experience. They didn't just say, I believe. I believe. I believe. Their believing produced obedience. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. They are being children of God produced obedience. I know the Lord. Their knowledge of the Lord produced obedience. I'm serving the Lord. The service of the Lord produced obedience. If there's anything by which Christians are known, said people are known, children of God are known, it is by obedience to the word of God. Where is grace if there's no obedience? Where is salvation if there's no obedience? Where is the hope of heaven if there is no obedience? And where is conversion if there is no obedience? For these believers, what made their faith public? What made their faith practical? What made their faith visible? What made their faith noticeable was the obedience. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet, I will have you to be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning that which is evil. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts, chapter 8, we're reading from verse 4. Acts, chapter 8, reading from verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? What were they doing? Preaching the word. They were not gossiping, preaching the word. Not spreading stories. Stories about people. Stories about families. Stories about members of the church. Stories about the apostles and the prophets and the teachers and the evangelists and the pastors in the church. Not going about, they were not going about whispering, tail bearing. They were going about, and there was only one thing they could do, and it was spreading the gospel, preaching the word. The young did it, the old did it, the adults did it, and the youths did it, the men did it, and the women did it. By the way, it was persecution that drove them away from Jerusalem. They were not talking about their persecution. They were not nursing their wounds. They were not talking about their pain, about their problems, about the pressures of the world on them. They just threw all that away. They were not complaining about anything. They were just spreading the gospel. That's the reason why the Lord has called us. If there's anything to do, it is to spread the gospel. Have you notice? How short a time you spend in the church? Monday Bible study, maybe two, three hours. Sunday worship, maybe two, three hours. 
and then you have the Thursday revival hour, maybe two, three hours. At the largest exchange, make it three hours, three times a week. That's only nine hours. And then maybe you're a worker, and then you go to the workers' meeting Tuesday, maybe another three hours. Then on Saturday, maybe another three hours, making five times. Three times five. What's that? Tell me out loud. Fifteen. There are 168 hours in the week. And we spend just about 15 hours in the church. Even if you make it 18, just to be on the larger side, 168 minus 18 is 150 hours still remaining. And if everything you do, I'm a worker, I'm a leader, only 18 hours at the most in the church. All the rest of the week, the 150 hours, that's why the world was one at that time. And he said, they that have turned the world upside down, they have come hither also. All those extra hours, big hours, long time, extensive time, they went everywhere preaching the word. They were not satisfied with only what they did. In the few hours they spent in the church, I pray that God will show us that revelation like that early church did. And then we see we have a lot to do and we spend more time in the world. We then make the gospel reach out to those people in the world in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 verse 14. I am a I'm debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Yeah, it's saying that the commitment of the believer ought to be to everyone. The wise, the barbarians, the unwise, the Greeks, that delighted in wisdom. And it's a same person. That saying, I'm a debtor, number one, to the Greeks. The same person, number two, to the barbarians. The same person, number three, to the wise. The same person, number four, to the unwise. There are some people that like to specialize. We're only for wise people. Well, if you're only for the wise people, that minority, because the majority of the world, they're uneducated, unwise, Barbarians, they know next to nothing. Am I committed to everyone? Other people say, I'm only kind of committed to the barbarians, to those who are illiterate. Well, how about those who are wise? They are the decision makers in the land. They are the people that rule. They are the people that steer any nation, every nation. Therefore, you cannot just sectionalize everything and say, I'm only for this, I'm only for that. The same Paul, the apostle, and the same believer, the same child of God, the same Thessalonians, they said we go everywhere and we reach everyone, to the Greeks, to the barbarians, to the wise, to the unwise, so that, in verse 15, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are true also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Only to those who believe when you hear the gospel. You receive it in your heart. You receive it in your mind. You receive it with faith. Then it works effectually in you when you present it convincingly, when you present it courageously, when you present it to bring up faith in the hearts of the people. It is that faith that they have as they receive that word that is preached convincingly, courageously, and preached with conviction. Is the faith in them 
believing that word that's what brings the change and the transformation that's how the believers in, in this place Thessalonica that's how they receive the word we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 2 Corinthians chapter 5 it made a mighty change in every one of them it's still the same today. The gospel, the word, and not, has not lost its power. Still doing the mighty work of transformation today. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, is what? A new creature. He was disobedient before. Now he's obedient. A new creature. Was sinful before. Nice, saintly, a new creature. It was defiled before. Now it's cleansed. Now it's different. A new creature. An adulterer before. Now it's straightforward, honest, pure, clean person. A new creature. It was addicted to evil, idolatry. Immorality before. Now it's different. It's now addicted and committed unto the Lord, unto righteousness. A new creature was unrighteous before. Everybody knew him to be notorious. But now, a new creature in the Lord. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, was a thief. He'll peel for your steel. Just look away. The very next moment, the property, the money is gone. It was a thief before. It's now an honest person working with his hand. The things that are good. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. And all things of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation that's given to the whole church. Give it to the whole church. Everyone that has become a new creature in Christ, it says he has given us this ministry that will be having the ministry of reconciliation to we, that is to say that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and not imputing their trespasses unto them and has committed unto us the word of reconciliation ministry of reconciliation in verse 18 word of reconciliation in verse 19 now then we are ambassadors for christ as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, we plead with you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled unto God. Be ye reconciled unto God. And is the whole church taking the whole gospel to the whole world. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 17. Revelation chapter 22. And we're looking at verse 17. And the spirit and the bride say, come. The bride of Christ, the people of God, the whole church, the young and the old. The men and the women. The high and the lowly. The educated and the illiterates, the adults, and the youth. Everyone, bride of Christ, and the spirit, and the bride say, come. And they say it in the day. And they say it in the evening. They say it in the marketplace. They say it in their communities. They say it in the schools. They say it in the colleges. They say it on the bus. They say it on the train. They say it everywhere. The bride 
The spirit and the bride say, come. Come to the light. Come to Christ. Come into the kingdom. And they say it quietly, one on one. They say it publicly in crusades. They say it in the village. They say it in the city. They say it in the town. They say it everywhere in the country. They say it everywhere in the continent. The spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that is the thirst come. And whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Point number two. Exemplary separation from a sinful community. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you. And now ye turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They made a turning around. They were devoted to dumb, dead idols that they called gods before. And they now knew that if you follow dead idols, your life will be dead, your soul dead, your spirit dead, everything about you dead. If you want to come alive, you turn away from the dead idols. Come out of darkness and you come to the living and the true God. How you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And when they did, they showed the evidence of that. Turning, turning, turning. Acts chapter 14, verse 15. Turn. That's the evidence of repentance. Turn. That's the evidence of conversion. Turn. That's the evidence of salvation. Turn. That is, you're not facing the direction you are facing before. You are facing the direction of hell. Of indignation. Of eternal judgment. Turn. Now you face the direction of heaven. The direction of light. The direction of glory. Turn. That's the word. Acts chapter 14. Verse 15. And say, sirs, what do ye the six? Look at what you do. And the spirit of the Lord is saying, why do ye the six? What's the purpose? What's the effect? What's the outcome? What's the destiny? Why do these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that it should turn. And preach unto you that it should turn. And preach unto you that it should turn. What's the difference between a dead church and a living church? A dead church has not turned. A living church has turned. What's the difference between a dead man and a living man? A dead man cannot turn. A living man has turned. What's the difference between somebody that has not the life of Christ? And the one that lasts the life of Christ, the one that has not the life of Christ, he has not turned. He cannot turn. He cannot change. He is today as he was yesterday. He is this year as he was last year. He is this period as he was in the past generation. He cannot turn. And, but the people that believe in the Lord, how do you know them? They have turned. That she turn from these vanities unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein turning, 
Let's look at Acts chapter 19. The people that have turned to the Lord, what he did? Verse 18. And many of them that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds, evil deeds that they did before. Many of them also which used curious arts, magical arts, occultic arts, idolatrous arts, many of them that choose that in the past. You know, when you are, big, when you are born again, you're not continuing that occultism. You're not continuing that, in that gang. You're not continuing that secret society. You're not continuing in that witchcraft. You'll not continue in the use of that talisman. You'll not continue in that waistband, the juju ring in your hand. Many of them which use curious occultic acts brought their books together. They didn't give the books as gifts to other people. I don't want to perish. I want you to perish. Have the material that will make you perish. No. I don't want to drink. You have the alcohol. I don't want to perish. You can perish. No. I don't want to smoke anymore, but all the secrets I've got, I'm going to sell to you. No. They threw them away. If that thing is poisonous, if that thing is destructive, if that thing is dangerous, you don't pass it on to other people, occultic acts. You don't pass that on. Idolatrous materials. You don't pass them on. Injurious, deadly, defiling clothes. You don't pass them on. That's a mighty change. And because you know you cannot use them anymore because they're defiling they're deadly. They're destructive. You know it will destroy your Christian life. You don't dash them away. Give them away. No. You burn them. You destroy them. It says they brought their books together. They brought those materials together. And they bunched them before all men. And they counted the price of them. They were willing to lose the money than to lose their souls. It says they found it 50,000 pieces of silver turning. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 14. Ezekiel chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 6. Turn. That's what repentance is all about. Turn. That's what change, transformation is all about. Turn. We're looking at Ezekiel 14, verse 6. Therefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Repent and turn. Repent and turn. That's salvation. Repent and turn. That's the only form of conversion recognized by God. Repent and turn. That's the only evidence that you have eternal life. If you have not repented, if you have not turned, there's no change. The same old, carnal, cruel, callous life is still there. There's no salvation there. There's no conversion there. There's no eternal life there. Repent and turn. Turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces from all your abominations. That's the evidence that we know the Lord. If I were told in Ezekiel chapter 18, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30, Therefore I will judge your house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn. That's the only way to have the mercy of God. Repent and turn. 
And when you go out to preach, when you go out to reveal to the people the way of the Lord, you're telling them, repent and turn. Sometimes you look at all these various crusades, open air meetings, and they gather hundreds of thousands of people together. And then the preacher gives a message. And it's a message of God is good and God is love and God is merciful and God is compassionate. He heals, he delivers, he provides. He gives the jobless jobs and he'll make the barren to be a mother of children. And it's going to brighten your future. And the Lord is going to do great, great things today. And if you want to receive Jesus as your personal Savior to bless your life and to heal your body and to, and to kind of take bad luck away from you where you raise up your hand and you then see hundreds of thousands of people raising up their hands. And then they say, put your hands together, clap for Jesus. What a great, great, mighty harvest. No, sir. There's no salvation without repentance. There's no salvation without turning. And dear friend, you spend all your life having all those massive crusades. And all you see is they raise up their hands and they wave it in the air. And then after we have gone, after we finish all that kind of mass meeting, they go back to their idolatry. And the church say they are doing follow up. And when you say you do follow up, you can't find a single soul of the people that have turned from their evil, no salvation, no conversion, a waste of time, a waste of life. The salvation is evidenced that you have turned, that you change, that a mighty conversion has taken place, and then you are able to say, the things I used to do, I do them no more. The places I used to go, I go there no more. This country, Nigeria, has large, big churches than almost any other country in Africa, maybe even in the world, apart from Korea. But all these thousands of people, have they turned? Have they repented? Millions of people in this country, religion without righteousness. And that will not take anyone to heaven. The evidence that the gospel has made a mark in your life, the evidence that the gospel has had a transforming effect in your life, the evidence that the gospel has had a life-changing effect in your life is the repentance and the turning for every man, for every woman that you turn away from the works of darkness and you come to the deeds of light. And as we're here, and they call deeper life a mega church, a big church, I pray we'll even grow greater in Jesus' name. Not collecting sinners together. I mean, large congregation of sinners that have not repented, of sinners that have not turned. And when you come to minister, all of us who are ministering, preaching, singing, and any other thing that we do in ministry, the purpose of that ministry. And the purpose of your section in the church, ministry to the people of God, is to emphasize one thing. The repenting and the turning. If your ministry does not have that effect, if your preaching does not have that effect, if your organization, administration does not have that effect, if your singing does not have that effect. It is worthless in the sight of the Lord. The reason why we minister and the reason why we have retreats and we have any other thing that we have is so that there will be repentance and turning. That is the way we started. That's the way we are going to continue. 
We have no interest. I have no interest in any big crowd or big people coming together, gatherings coming together. If we have no chance of transformation, repentance and turning, and the Lord is going to do it in every life in Jesus' name. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30, second part of verse 8, of verse 30. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Turn, turn, turn. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. We're reading there from verse 4. In Jonah chapter 3. Jonah went to the city of Nineveh. Those were people that were sinful exceedingly. They had almost got to the peak of sinning. And yet they turned. And yet they repented. And if those people that have gone to the very extreme of sinning, if they could turn and repent, the rest of us have not gone as far as they have gone. We can turn to, we'll turn in Jesus' name. And he turned because of God, not because of man, not because of Jonah, not because of Jonah, not because of Jonah. They turned because of God. There's a God in heaven, the judge of all the earth. Jonah couldn't bring the judgment on them when he said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah couldn't overthrow that city. It was God. He just came to announce the judgment of God coming upon the unrepentant sinner. They feared God. They believed God. It was because of God they turned. And if you are there, you have come to this church you're not turning because of me. You're not repenting because of me. You're not becoming righteous because of me. You're not getting saved because of me. You're getting saved because you believe in God. You're getting saved. Becoming righteous. Becoming holy. Turning away. From all your sin, from all your evil, become a new creature in Christ because you believe God that God judges sin. And that if continuing sin, private sin, or public sin, habitual sin, or besetting sin, you believe God that God will bring judgment. The people who don't believe in God and they do whatever they do because of Jonah, because of man, those are not believers. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh, tell me the next two words. Tell me those next two words. Say that aloud. They believed God. God wasn't there in the physical. Only Jonah there. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. The man did not even mention the name of God. God is going to do this, but he knew. And as you come to this church, whatever you do, you do it because of God. Whatever you believe, you believe it because of God. Yes, I preach the repentance, but you believe it because of God. Yes, I believe conversion, and I preach it. You believe it because of God. I preach holiness, sanctification. You're not believing it because of me. 
You are believing because of God. For no peace with all men. And holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You believe it because of God. If you pull it down, you are not pulling it down because of me. If you don't leave it, you're not leaving it, not because of me, because you don't believe in God. When you believe in God, here is the word of the Lord. And the people of Nineveh believed God, and they proclaimed a fast. And he put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For the word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne. And he did, he laid his robe of royalty of the king from him. And he covered him, was sat close and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published, published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything. Let them not feed, nor drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto who? Unto who? You see, when you hear the word of God, the right attitude is to understand it's coming from God. In fact, that's why what separated. What distinguished the Thessalonian believers? Because when they had the word of God, they received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. The word of God, which worketh effectually in them that believe. The things you hear of God, Whenever you hear, it may come in an announcement. If you come to it, it's an announcement by the group coordinator, by the coordinator. If that's what you think, you think, I'm free to do it or not to do it. Whenever you hear us preaching the word, emphasizing the word, and we read almost from cover to cover in the Bible, and we just say, well, that's his, you know, pet doctrine, that's... His opinion, that's his idea. You're not going to do that. But when you accept, when you believe, this is the word of the Lord. That's why people do it. Then he tells us in verse, in verse 10, And God saw their works that they, they did what? Tell me out loud. You know, if this retreat, the power for your hour, does not turn you, you hear the word, you hear the message, the preachers are preaching, the singers are singing, the prayer warriors are praying, intercessors are interceding, and we read the word. Over and over. And we're talking about the one single thing that will get you to heaven. If in this retreat, you don't turn, judgment will come. Eternal doom, damnation will come. We we'll preach the whole word here. We're not just encouraging people, motivating people, making them clap their hands. But we prefer you don't clap your hands, even after prayer. There's nothing to rejoice about if you have not turned from your sin. If you are not born again, there's no new life. If adultery is still there, fornication is still there. We used to sing, tell me your joy, if you are not born again. You don't know the Lord. Stop all that clapping of the hands. After singing... After praying, after preaching, we don't need your commendation. All we need from you is that repentance. That's what God saw. Verse 10. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God 
repented, relented of the evil that he had said that he will do unto them. And he did it not. That is how they escaped the judgment of God. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 and verse 26. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore. Repent ye therefore. Check up your life. Look at your life. Sin is deadly. Sin is defiling. And sin is damning. It brings you doom and damnation. Repent ye therefore. And be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In verse 26 unto you. First, God having raised up his son, Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away, in turning away, in turning away. How many people? Every one of you from your iniquities. These Tessalon and believers, that's what they manifested, a total change, a total transformation, a total renewal, in their lives. Point number three now, expectant saints waiting for Christ's second coming. Expectant saints waiting for Christ's second coming. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 10, and to wait, and to wait, and to wait, that was a lively hope. It will be a rotten hope if they were not converted and they were waiting for the second coming. That will be a rotten hope, a deceptive hope. But because they are changed, because new life had come to them, because a transformation had taken place, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus. The one coming again is the same Christ, the one who went to heaven, the one who died for us, the one who was buried three days, and the one who rose again the third day, and the one after 40 days of having infallible proofs showed himself unto his disciples alive, and he was taken up to heaven. That's the same one that is coming back again. And these Tessana believers, they knew that. And they were waiting for his son from heaven. Have you noticed? I'm sure you have not, you have not noticed this. But in every chapter of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, the coming of Christ is spoken about. That's in chapter 1. Look at chapter 2. In chapter 2, we're looking at verse 19. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are ye in, are, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? At his coming. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 12, verse 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you to the end. Ye may, be, ye may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming. At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. In chapter 4, it's referred to again the coming of the Lord. We're looking at it from verse 13. But I will not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this will say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord, the coming of the Lord shall not hinder or prevent or disturb them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven 
with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise forth, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord, wherefore comfort one another with these words. In every chapter, the coming of the Lord being referred to. Look at chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that we write that I write unto you. For ye yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night is coming. Look at chapter 1 of the of the Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And to you. What trouble rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. You see, Christ is coming over and over. Look at chapter 2. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, we beseech you that Christ is coming. Remember that. And then it says that she be not so shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by the word, nor by the letters from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. A falling away and we're seeing that all around, falling away from sound doctrine, falling away from righteousness, falling away from holiness emphasis in the churches. There's a falling away already, and it says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. I pray you'll not follow after them. I said you'll not follow after them. Chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 3, verse 5, and the Lord directs your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Into the patient waiting for Christ. That tells us then that the Lord is coming. And of course, the people of God knew that even from the time of Job, Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. Reading from verse 25, 1925, for I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold. And not another, though my rays be consumed within me. That's the expectation in the heart of all the saints of God, in the hearts of all the people of God, even from that time in the Old Testament, that the Lord, the Redeemer, is coming again, and we're waiting for him. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7, verse 8. First Corinthians chapter 1. Reading from verse 7 and reading from verse 8. So that ye come behind in no gift, but beyond the gifts, beyond the ministry, and beyond the opportunity of service, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Expectation in the hearts of all the people of God. And they lived as if he might come today. They lived as if he might come this very week with that expectation in their hearts, living in righteousness and holiness all the days of their lives, expecting that when the Lord comes, the people he will rapture, the people he will resurrect, the people he will take away are the people that have lived a life that showed conversion, repentance, turning, holiness, righteousness, sanctification. In verse 8, we shall also confirm you unto the end. 
that she may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 34. Luke chapter 12, verse 34. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If your treasure is in heaven, your heart will be there. Your desires in heaven, your heart will be there. Your joy in heaven, your heart will be there. Your Christ in heaven, the most important person to you, your heart will be there. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be guarded about, and your lights burning. And ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord. Men that wait for their Lord. Like men that wait expectantly for their Lord. When he will return from the wedding. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. I pray you'll be ready. I said I pray you'll be ready. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed at those servants and this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour, what time, what period, and what moment the thief would come, he would have watched not, and not to have suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also by repenting, by turning, by being converted, by being saved, by being righteous, by being holy, by being obedient to the word of the Lord, not the word of man. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Chapter 21 of Luke. Luke chapter 21. I'm reading there from verse 34. Luke chapter 21. Reading from verse 34. And take it to yourselves. Lest at any time your heart be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness. These were believers who are not drinking alcohol. But there are some people that little things intoxicate them, like alcohol, marriage, celebration, wedding. Intoxicates them, like alcohol. Graduation, matriculation, intoxicates them like alcohol, childbirth, naming ceremony. Intoxicate them like alcohol. They lose all the doctrine, all the conviction, everything they ever learned because of marriage, wedding, childbirth, naming ceremony. Burial, funeral ceremony, intoxicates them like alcohol. And the Lord said, watch that that day doesn't come upon you on a ways. Because so that the day come upon you on a ways. Verse 35, verse his name, shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the earth. Watch ye therefore. And pray always that she may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. The Lord is coming. He wants you, He wants me, He wants us, He wants the whole church to be ready for His coming. Do you get ready? Repenting, turning, living a righteous life, a holy life, an obedient life, a sober life. 
Revelation 16, verse 15. Behold, I come as a thief. That means suddenly, when people are not expecting, blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and you see a shame. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. In Second Peter chapter 3, from verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, scorners, jesters, doubters, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water, and in the water whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. When Noah announced that the judgment was coming, he jested, the scorned, the scoffed. How can that happen? They were willingly, deliberately, intentionally ignorant. And in these last days, we have a repetition of that. That's why the apostle is warning us, it says in verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in stone and reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is of the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish. I pray you'll not perish. By repentance, I pray you'll not perish. By turning away from all your sins, I pray you'll not perish. By life of obedience and holiness unto the Lord, every moment of your life, not yielding to the influence of scorners and scoffers, living a life pleasing unto the Lord in righteousness and holiness all the days of your life. I pray you'll not perish in Jesus' name. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. But is long suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burnt up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we According to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that she look for such things, are you looking for the coming of the Lord? Are you waiting for the coming of the Lord? If you are doing that in your own heart, it says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent, not careless. Not negligent, not carefree, not unconcerned, 
be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. I pray the Lord will make us ready. I said he'll make us ready. I said he'll make you ready. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. We've heard much. We've heard much. That's the word of the Lord. We receive it as the word of the Lord, not as the word of a man. I said, get up. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.